And if they're the same, then an error hasn't happened. Uh, and if you find that the answer is they're different, and this is a binary question, are they the same or are they is one different? Then you would find that somewhere on these four, you have an error, yeah? And this allows you, along with making looking at correlations between these four and between these four, it allows you to locate where errors might have occurred, and then you can go in and correct them. So if you like, this is the long game of quantum computing. You, you take systems which are made of many systems, you connect them together in such a way that you can perform these correlation checks, and you make this system extremely large, and in the limit that it gets large, then you win uh, in your error correction capability. So you can look at what needs to be done in the long term, right? And this is where the explosion comes from. So uh, one of the popular ways of doing error correction is on a lattice, which is, uh, comes under the name of a surface code. Uh, and you can look at what the errors are for every operation you make on one of these objects, right? And, and one classic thing is to ask what happens if you connect two of these. And so I can take numbers here, which are better than any operation that anyone ever did in a quantum computer. And I can ask the question, what does it take to do a reasonable size algorithm? This is a Shor's algorithm. So it's factoring uh, on a decent size number that we can't easily do with a classical computer. And there, what you find is even with error rates, which are very small, smaller than we get in any system today, you see that the number of uh, qubits, physical systems I need for every logical qubit uh, is very large. Here, more than a thousand, here, uh, still close to a thousand, right? And this is the explosion, which takes you from some system you might imagine can be computed with a thousand qubits. Uh, suddenly, you have to multiply by this factor of a thousand, and that takes you to around a million qubits. So that's the end game of any quantum error correction scheme. Uh, but quantum error correction is a little bit more flexible uh, than just thinking about these sort of codes. So the qubit codes that I just described, what do they do? They, in a sense, uh, take many systems. So seven systems here, for instance, can store much more information than just two states, a qubit, a single qubit of information, right? But they then, by having seven, they create a lot of redundancy. And that creates a distance that allows them to be tolerant to the types of errors that they have. And that's the same thing you have in classical uh, logic. And, and it comes in two ways. In classical logic, you can have classical codes, right, which use repetition, basically, to defend you. It's also the thing that happens in the digital logic, classically, uh, where you have a million electrons in one place or a million electrons in another place, which define your one and zero. And essentially, that's some sort of error correction code. And where people are today with exploring these multi-qubit codes is roughly the following, right? So people, a very nice result in the last year from the Honeywell group, if you like, was that they were able to perform quantum error correction on, on the, one of the smallest codes you can think of that involves seven qubits. Uh, and they have to add another four ions to do these checks of correlations. And they can repeatedly do that and, and they can correct for the errors that they see. Though the caveat with that is that all the checking is currently the worst thing that you can do to the qubits. So in a sense, the system decays faster when you keep checking and trying to correct errors still than when the system is left alone. So I'm going to look in a slightly different way, and, and uh, that is to try and think of other ways to correct errors and maybe explore these concepts of error corrections in another formalism. And that's where we start to talk about bosonic codes. So this, uh, instead of thinking about having many systems to create redundancy, it thinks of the fact that an oscillator is something with a very large Hilbert space, which already has a lot of redundancy in that Hilbert space compared to the Hilbert space of a two level system. So there we can think of how do the errors uh, differ from the, uh, the types of operations that we would like to do and, and how can we make our uh, bosonic systems, these are harmonic oscillators, different uh, in nature to the errors that happen on them. And this is one, this is the classic case of the GKP code that I'm going to talk about today. And what you see here, as I said before, is this discrete structure. So you see that the structure uh, at certain distances from each other, but there's no probability between these gaps. And in a sense, the protection of this code from errors comes from the fact that there's empty space between these two. There's a discrete structure here that got imposed on the continuous space. And now if this whole structure moves a little bit, 
I can start to see that the structure moved into this region here because I get some probability to measure the particle here. And I can correct for that before this system moved by a whole unit of this lattice. And that's going to be really the key uh, to error correction in these codes. And I'll return to that in a moment. So I've emphasized there that just having a larger Hilbert space is what allows you to correct uh, errors. And I think I just come back to that point. So when we think about a qubit, it's a two level system, right? And I can write a general superposition of a qubit, something like this. And that I can write uh, also its density matrix. And one of the nice ways to plot out a density matrix is on this uh, block sphere that we have here. And that's to ask uh, if I take this two state system and project it on the various Pauli eigenstates of the Pauli operators, I can represent this density matrix by some weights which correspond to, to my expectation values of the various values that I get for uh, projection onto these eigenvectors. So what does that mean? It means that this density matrix is for a pure state on the surface of this block sphere. Uh, and I can think about uh, the whole qubit as where it points on this block sphere. Now, one of the things that happens is in a, a single qubit is that the algebra of that single qubit is generated by just two of these uh, Pauli operators. And so one of the challenges when I'm trying to conceive of how to correct for errors is that there's no real, I feel I've jumped somewhere, there's no real way of measuring this system. There's no operator I can measure on this system, which uh, doesn't disturb the stored information, right? So if I try and interfere with the system to find something about errors, then I'm going to have to find operators which commute with X, Y, and Z, these operators which tell us about the uh, system. Uh, but the problem is that's exactly where my logic is stored, and these all anti-commute with each other. So I, I somehow can't do that, right? So uh, with that in mind, then what I need in general, uh, not thinking about numbers of qubits or a bosonic system or anything, is that I need Hilbert spaces, which are going to have dimension greater than two, in order to be able to make measurements of some characteristic of the system. And that, for me, is going to be whether I can see errors or not without destroying the qubit itself. Hey, Jonathan. Okay. Let me come back to a point that I will use later. Okay. So one of the important things about this block sphere is that it makes it easy uh, to think about what happens when I have operators that look something like this, which uh, are operators which have a Pauli matrix in the exponential yeah, and an imaginary factor. And these are all rotations of the block sphere. What they do is that they don't do anything to the eigenvectors uh, of the Pauli matrix that I have here. They just add a phase to those, if you like. And what that corresponds to is a rotation in the other plane of the uh, block sphere, in the perpendicular plane. And the angle of rotation uh, would be two theta in this case. Uh, and now if I was to measure anything, uh, if I was measuring the Pauli uh, matrices, if you like, if I was measuring y or x, I would look at the projections of this state onto these uh, given uh, vectors. Uh, Jonathan, just to clarify, maybe in the previous yep. slide, the commutator you mean must be the group commutator, which is, uh, what is it, x, z, x, z equals minus one. Not yeah, you're one. right. Yes, so sorry, yes, no, I've written that wrong. That's right. Yeah. No, no, you the point I want, yeah, some, somehow the point I wanted to make was that they anti commute with each other. That's what I'm going to use actually later. Yeah. So sorry about that. Um, Good, so how do we uh, define a code on a continuous uh, space? Okay, so what we're looking for is the fact that we would like to produce operators which are going to anti-commute with each other to define logic, because that's the rule we have for the um, Pauli operators, if you like. Uh, and we also want some operators which are gonna commute with those. And the way we construct that in this GKP code is by examining the fact that we can make displacements in uh, phase space, okay? And here I have operators, which this one generates translations in momentum. This is Q is the position. This one generates translations in uh, position, yeah? And if I reverse the order of those, so you'll see here I've written that in the opposite order, then that comes along with an additional phase factor that I should uh, be aware of. Yeah, and that phase factor is important uh, because uh, it's going to come in useful. I'm going to use this as a construction to define the relationships between operators. So let's think about uh, a grid of points, if you like, uh, on a phase space. So here's position, here's momentum. Uh, and I can have these two displacements. And 
If I go first with the vertical displacement, that's the displacement uh, e to the i q, if you like, and then with the momentum displacement, then what happens is I subtend a little triangle here. Yeah. And what I would find is that if I went the other route, I did the blue one first and I did the red one second, I would find that I get a triangle, but I've traversed it in the opposite sense. Yeah. And that's what leads to the, uh, it's this area of these triangles, which is proportional to these phase factors that I get here. So the nice thing about that is that if I can choose the values of alpha and beta, I can choose whether these displacement operators will anti-commute, i.e. if alpha beta is an odd integer of pi, I get a minus one here and they uh, anti-commute with each other. Uh, and if it's an even multiple, then I get that they commute with each other, right? So somehow by choosing displacements, orthogonal displacements on this phase space, I can choose uh, whether I get commuting operators or anti-commuting operators. And so that gets used for the Pauli operators. What do I do? Well, I choose that I, I construct uh, the size of this displacement and the size of this displacement so that I get e to the i pi sitting here. I satisfy this first condition. And then I know that this operator will anti-commute with this operator. And indeed the diagonal, which is just z times uh, x or minus z times x here, uh, will actually also anti-commute with both of those. Okay? And then if I want to make operators which commute with both of those, well, it better have twice the area so that I get an even multiple of pi. And this is how I define my error check operators. They're just double the displacement distance uh, in the phase space. And what this means that any area, area of a triangle I would make up between say Z and this error check operator in S will be twice as large a triangle and I get then uh, a commutation relation rather than anti-commutation. So what can we take home from this? We can take home that we have uh, logical operators which are discrete displacements by a certain amount. Here I choose them to be both root pi in the phase space and the error check operators which are just double those displacements. And what does this mean in practice? It means that we need, uh, if we're going to make states which are eigenstates of all of these operators, they've got to be eigenstates, for instance, of both of these error checks actually and one of these operators to define some logical information. So if I want the zero logical state, it should have periodicity in the position direction, which is given by square root of pi, if you like, or one over square root of pi, uh, and it should also repeat on the length scale of the stabilizer. So um, what do we find? We find that the logical state should be simultaneous eigenstates of all of, the, of these sets of displacements. And if we're going to read out the error information, that's gonna be these error check operators or the logical information, we're going to have to make measurements of displacement. So these are the two things we're going to have to construct uh, in order to use these codes. So um, let me first tell you about the theoretical way of uh, thinking about this. So uh, here you would like to make logical states, which when you translate them by a fixed amount, that's what these uh, displacements operators are, that they repeat. And so one way to do that is to take uh, delta functions and just have an infinite array of delta functions, which are all spaced by uh, a certain amount, right? And so the zero state would look something uh, like this. This is the stabilizer distance, if you like. This is the one that tells you about the error check. And I want a state for one, which is orthogonal to that and which is connected to it by a displacement, which is half the distance, right? So the X operator would take me from zero to one it displaces me by exactly half this two root pi distance. And now you see that these states are orthogonal. They've got no overlap in position space, yeah, these two. And uh, they're nicely distinguishable from each other. So that, that's two good eigenstates. And what's gonna happen as you make errors? What, what type of errors happen to an oscillator? One of them will just shift the position of the oscillator, okay? So as we shift the position of the oscillator randomly, these peaks will broaden into some Gaussian distribution due to that error, right? And the key to the code is to say, okay, well, it's gonna spread, there'll be some spread, but as long as I can make a discrete result, as long as I can measure, am I in this region or am I in that region, then as long as this state doesn't spread so much that it starts to inhabit this region, then as long as I can spot that there's some spread and bring myself back to the peak, uh, before uh, the spread has got too bad, uh, 
I can still distinguish this state from this state here. And so I still have a situation in which I am protected. I, I can return this Gaussian back to a delta function here. And as long as I'm ambiguous about whether I'm in this state and this state, I can also preserve superpositions of these states, right? So somehow what you see there is a digitization of space. You go to this digital discrete uh, set of points. Uh, and as the space becomes continuous due to errors, you can still go back and you digitize in the sense that you say between these two dashed lines, I come back to the central point here. And that's exactly what we'll do later. Now, the, the, the situation is a bit more complicated than that. And that's because we don't have delta functions in real life, right? And we don't have infinite arrays of delta functions in real life. So um, the approximation to this picture that you have up here is that even without errors, typically the quantum states that you have are not delta functions, but they are squeeze states in position, right? And superpositions of uh, squeeze states, and they sit under a Gaussian envelope. Yeah, and uh, this is a good approximation. This is the finite energy approximation, if you like, to these states. And what you see is that you still have fairly distinguishable distributions here, i.e. the zero one is fairly well distinguished from one, but you have to tolerate some finite overlap that sits there, right? What, what does that mean? That means that even using perfect states now, you'll get some level of error, yeah? And you have to deal with that error. But the main principle would be if that error is small enough due to these finite states, then you can still live, you can still perform your error correction. Uh, and this error that's happening due to this overlap uh, is small enough that it doesn't matter for you. Okay. So we're going to be dealing with these finite states because I work in a laboratory and so I only have finite energy. Uh, and what they are is superpositions of squeezed states, in this case, in position. Yeah. Uh, and they're uh, a superposition of five of them in this case, and the one state is an, a sort of orthogonal or almost orthogonal superposition. I can look at this also in the momentum picture, and I, that's going to be useful uh, afterwards. Momentum, uh, of course, I'm plotting the, the wave function squared here, but the momentum is, of course, the Fourier transform of the position wave function, right? And if I look at that for both of these types of cases, I actually see that all the peaks are filled, right? It's still got a Gaussian envelope and it's got the frequency, uh, which is twice one of the logical eigenstates yeah, in this case. So these are the zero and one states. Actually, the plus X and, and minus X states would be the corresponding picture. I would have swapped this picture here uh, over to the momentum space and this picture here over to the position space. Yeah. Uh, hi, Jonathan. So, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so will we... Will we talk about some concrete numbers in terms of um, given the amount of squeezing we can do in the lab, uh, how much noise we can tolerate? Um, or like when you say that small noise uh, in this setting, what do we mean by small noise? Yeah, it, I mean, it really depends on the overlap you have. I guess I will tell you some numbers that are relevant to that later on. So Sounds uh, good. And yeah. also, do we talk about or will we talk about anything related to uh, photon loss noise? besides the displacement noise? So um, photon loss noise to lowest order can be modeled as displacements. Yeah, so in a certain sense, this type of code covers photon loss. Uh, the errors we have, uh, we couple to a, a relatively high temperature bath. Uh, and so actually the, a good way to think about our heating rate, that's what we would say is one source of error, is as random displacements. It's actually very well covered by that model. Uh, you'll see a bit later that the code doesn't work perfectly for us. And part of that is that one of our errors is actually dephasing, which is rotating the phase space continually. Uh, and that's, uh, I mean, can be approximated to lowest order uh, as sets of displacements, but it's not quite a homogeneous displacement and we run into problems from that. Yeah. Sounds good, thank you. Good, thanks for the question. Okay, so uh, I'm going to quickly state that this picture that I've given you of superpositions of squeeze states is actually how we originally made GKP states. So we were playing around at the time with uh, originally superpositions of uh, coherent states, which we would call Schrodinger's cat states. And we'd also been playing around with squeeze states. And uh, I watched a talk by Barbara Terhall where she said the combination of the two is interesting. And, and that's what really pricked our ears up into this field at all. Uh, and this is a result from a few years ago where we superposed squeeze states and were able to characterize these GKP states. But that's mainly not the talk uh, that I'm giving today. I want to talk today about the challenges of making measurements on these states and of doing error correction on the states. 
So let me tell you a bit about how we do that. So we use a trapped ion. A trapped ion is a two level system uh, for the sake of this talk, which oscillates in a potential and it interacts with a laser. And when, when this ion uh, oscillates in the laser field, it phase modulates the laser field and you get modulation sidebands, right? So if you looked at the spectrum as you sweep over the qubit resonance, you would see a main peak in the middle and you would see also these uh, modulation sidebands. And what we do for all the operations I'm going to talk about today is we, we drive with two frequencies of our laser on both sidebands simultaneously. And what that does is it makes us a Hamiltonian, which couples the uh, position of the oscillator or the momentum we can actually choose by choosing the phase of these drives to the spin state of the qubit uh, of the internal state of the atom. Yeah. And that's a Hamiltonian that we can realize. If we realize that for a certain amount of time, we can make a, a unitary transformation. Uh, and it looks like an exponential with the position of the oscillator sitting there and also this spin operator sitting up there. Yeah. And I've already told you a little bit about what happens when we have these sort of operations. I, I can tell you what happens to the spin because it's a spin rotation, right? That's what we saw before was an exponential of a Pauli matrix produces a rotation of the spin. So with that in mind, then what we want to do is we want to examine this sort of circuit. This is going to be the basis for the rest of the talk, where on the top line, I'm dealing with the oscillator. Okay, the oscillator's coordinate is given by Q. On the bottom line, I've got a spin, which has been started in the state zero. It's a qubit. Uh, and at the end of the day, I measure it. Okay, so let's think what that does. Uh, the spin starts in the zero state, right? And at the end, I'm going to measure the comp a component of the spin, and I won't specify quite what that does yet. So I start with a, a, a qubit, which is in the zero state, and that's vertical on this block sphere. And now I apply this operation, which is a rotation about the x-axis of the block sphere, which is proportional now to the position and to the uh, some amount of time that I apply the rotation. So I get a rotation, right? Uh, and that's given by this two alpha times the position. And for the moment, just imagine the position is classical, right? Just so we get a feeling for what happens. Now I can do one of two things, right? I can measure the spin. I can either measure it in the Y basis or in the Z basis, and I'll get a value which is a projection onto those axes. That's going to be the average value that I get. So if I measure along Z, I get a value which is a cosine of this rotation angle, which is somehow an operator here that you see as an operator on the harmonic oscillator space. And if I measure in the Y basis, I get the sign of that thing, yeah? So just to say that I jumped, I said I treat this as a classical coordinate, and now I jump back to using introducing operators. But what you would see is that this is an oscillator on the motion, and the spin outcomes I get from measuring on these two axes is given by just the expectation value of the input state uh, with this particular operator stuffed in. So I either get something that's proportional to the expectation value of the cosine or the expectation of value of the sine of something that's uh, related to the position of the oscillator. Now, there's a complication in the fact that I started jumping between having coordinates or, os or uh, operators here. And that's that we have to think what happens in the motional space, right? There's also the harmonic oscillator to think about. So let's look at that same operation in the phase space. Okay, in the phase space of an oscillator. Here's uh, momentum now, here's position. And I'm going to try and measure what the value of the position is. And how do I do that? Uh, I apply this displacement. And what happens is, depending on which eigenstate of X I'm in, I get an amount of phase, right? Either e to the minus I alpha Q or e to the plus I alpha Q. But what you see is that I also split the oscillator wave packet. It might be this blob to start with. I split it into two pieces. Yeah, and that creates entanglement between the position of the oscillator and the uh, coordinate uh, and the spin basis that I'm using, right? And that's a problem in the picture that I gave you before, because I told you about a coherent rotation, which I then project out. But if I don't have overlap here, then I can't think in terms of a coherent rotation of the spin. And this was a problem for us in making measurements on these finite GKP states. So here, what I'm plotting is a GKP state uh, as a function of its position, uh, of its momentum rather. But, and we're making a, a measurement here, uh, which is uh, making displacements in the momentum coordinate in order to measure something about the position, yeah? And what we see is that the two components of the spin that we get separate from each other, 
and they don't overlap perfectly anymore. And what I'll see is that that reduces the contrast with which I can measure the spin rotation. And that's going to hurt me in the long term because it means I can't measure my position as well as I thought I could measure the position. And this was actually already a problem in those original results that we had on GKP state. So you can see here that uh, what I'm doing is making a measurement of my spin observable. Uh, here I should get, I think, a cosine of whatever the value is. Uh, and here I'm doing it as a function of displacement uh, amplitude. Now what's happening here is that I'm taking this uh, distribution here and I start to separate the peaks. And as I lose overlap between the two states, then you see that the thing drops down towards zero. It doesn't quite get to zero, right? Because what happens then is as I displace more, that the peaks, the, the small peaks start to overlap again. They interfere and I get a signal again. But the problem I have on top of that is that this envelope is finite, right? And the envelope means that this revival is now not perfect, but it only partially goes up. And then I see that my peaks stop overlapping again, and then I come back again, but by then I've lost even more overlap of my envelope. Yeah? And this is a problem, as you can see, if I'm measuring a logical operator, it means I only get 90% probability of getting uh, my logical one. Yeah? Uh, and here I get even worse outcomes for the stabilizer. So this is one of the things we wanted to fix. And the problem there is that the observables I'm using, the observable I'm trying to measure this displacement operator, is uh, my code states, my finite states here are not exact eigenstates of these observables, right? And that's why I'm getting imperfect outcomes when I try to measure. So one of the key steps that we made in the last few years was to discover how to beat this problem, right? So this is the direct measurement of this displacement operator. This is how you do that. And you saw this separation in the previous slide. But one of the things we spotted, if we plot this in momentum space, then we can make prior to doing this measurement, this operation here, this coupling here, we can make a measurement which depends now on the momentum of the state and acts in the other basis, the Y basis, right? So what does that do? It, at different positions of momentum, we get a different rotation now about the Y axis. And what that does, if I look in the X basis, is it creates a different amplitude of being in the plus X state or being in the minus X state. And it's an amplitude that depends on the position that I have here. And what does that mean? That means that we can actually make a bias, which means that for peaks sitting over here, we have a higher weight to be in the minus X state and a lower weight to be in the plus X state. Whereas for peaks over here, it's the opposite. And what that means is once I apply this displacement in the other direction, I don't anymore end up with two separated wave packets which are entangled with the spin, but I have rather a good overlap between the two wave packets which uh, correspond to the two different spin projections. And that means I retain now high contrast in my spin, in my logical readout. Yeah. So we can see this here, the, the theory is the, probably the place to start. So here is the case if I didn't apply this correction uh, for the state size of states that we used, that we would get about a 90% outcome. And if I do apply the correction, I get to better than 99 point, uh, I think 99.8% or something like that. It's really a very good correction factor. Now here's actually the data. We don't do as well as that. We do improve. We move from about 83 up to 92% or so. And that's consistent with the fact that our GKP states that we make are not quite pure states because they're decaying all the time. Yeah. It's a more dramatic gain for us in the stabilizer operator. There we would have in theory go from 65 to 95. Uh, in our case, we go from 50% to a 75% readout outcome for the stabilized operator. And actually this gain that you get uh, gets better and better if you can achieve more squeezing and uh, larger states. Uh, and what this does is it really, uh, the correction starts to make you feel, uh, this is the uncorrected value. I think these are corrected values. Uh, and you see a significant gain in the fidelities. It, uh, this is infidelity now, a reduction in the infidelities of the readout of these various uh, operations. So uh, this was a significant uh, step, I think, theoretically. Uh, and it was simultaneously, I should say, made by uh, Jakob Hastrop in uh, Ulrich Anderson's group and also Steve Gervin and Baptiste Royer at uh, Yale. Uh, Jonathan, is there any, okay, maybe you're gonna discuss it, but I guess I would conceptually, I still struggle to understand this. Maybe there's an analog in the qubit world for something like this. 
And you mentioned in the qubit world. Yeah. Um, that analogy. Yeah, I would have to. I'm not sure. Yeah, I would have to think about it. I think. I mean, somehow um, the. Well, I don't know. I think somehow a qubit doesn't have enough degrees of freedom, if you like, or degrees of freedom is maybe the wrong thing, but enough freedom to be able to do this biasing, yeah, is my feeling. So uh, my hunch is that you'd need many qubits coupled to your single qubit. So indeed, in a multi-qubit state, there may be ways to do this, but I would guess it's not very easy to do in just a two-qubit state, for instance. Yeah. It's almost like the difference between Tor code and double semi on ground state, where the latter has a bunch of minus ones scattered around states and somehow that helps when you turn it around into a different basis but you mentioned some other yeah. dynamical, dynamical decoupling or some some quantum optical effect that you think of yeah i think it's uh, yes yeah, so, so there i i don't feel it's similar to dynamical decoupling because it's sort of it's only a single effect and it's actually quite a you know what we do here this epsilon value is quite a small rotation angle compared to what the displacement is we finally so it's sort of like you tweak your basis states here in a way that's clever in order to make sure that this operator here doesn't produce too much spin motion entanglement that's the that's the key uh, and um yeah other than that i can't think of a good way to to phrase it yeah so sorry yeah <laughs> good can i move on or yeah yeah Good, so um, I've just talked about measurement of these operators, but now what I want to show you is how you actually cor do correction in these things. And I, I should say that these methods come from this very nice paper from the Yale group, uh, where they were the first to perform correction on these GKP states. And I think our work derives from theirs uh, in a very nice interplay between the two groups, I should say. So uh, as I said, the, the aim in error correction of these states is somehow to take uh, an initial distribution that has maybe broadened into a Gaussian and to narrow it, yeah? And I'm gonna try and explain it in terms of a Bayesian picture, uh, a sort of classical Bayesian picture. So what happens? We, we apply uh, this interaction and we then measure. And if we measure in quantum mechanics, we project into one of the spin states. And what you've seen is that the uh, measurement probability uh, in the y, y basis, for instance, is proportional to something to do with the sign of my coordinate, okay? So what I've done here is I've just said, what's the probability to measure myself in the plus y state given that I'm at a certain coordinate? And this is the red uh, curve that you see here. And here's the curve for measuring myself in the minus y state. And you see that it should be, those two should add to be one, right? So these are conditional probabilities. And now we should ask ourselves, what's the uh, distribution if we update according to Bayes' rule, uh, the original distribution that we had by the conditional probabilities given that we measured plus or minus y. So that's what I've done here. This is a row plus, if you like, a new distribution that corresponds to uh, this conditional probability Bayes' rule versus uh, multiplied by the original probability distribution or density. And I did the same here. And what you see is that I've chosen the parameters well, such that I get two Gaussian uh, distributions. And the other thing you see is that these Gaussian distributions are displaced from the origin, yeah? So in order to do correction, uh, well, one thing I'm going to want to do is to make sure that I move the system back towards the origin. And for this red curve, then I get a signal that I'm in the plus Y state, it tells me, well, move your state back by this amount into the origin of phase space. If I'm in the minus y state, then I should condition on getting that and move in this direction in the phase space, right? And I move them in, and then I get this distribution here. And the key feature of that distribution here is it achieves what we want, right? Uh, it achieves what we want because it's a narrower Gaussian. And remember my game was basically to, to narrow this Gaussian distribution. And so what I have there is that the interaction, the bare interaction, I measure the y state of my spin, and then I apply a displacement back on the oscillator, which just depends on what the outcome was I had here. And in the Yale experiment, this was done with fast classical logic and, and a displacement that they made to their oscillator. Now, I need to narrow Gaussians. And the way I described it before, the only thing you might want to narrow is this, uh, are these peaks, these squeezed peaks. But actually there's another Gaussian in this problem. And this was really the clever trick I found from these guys. 
Uh, and the problem is that as you're making these measurements, as I've just told you before, uh, you start to make this envelope Gaussian bigger. The, the whole system spreads out, okay? And so you end up not just having to narrow the individual peaks here, the narrow Gaussians, but you also have to narrow this envelope continuously. Yeah? And that's what they did in the Yale experiment. So every time they did a cycle of error correction to narrow the narrow peaks, they also had to accompany that by narrowing the envelope. Right. So they had what they call sharpen of peaks and then trimming envelopes and sharpening. And you see that this goes from being position to momentum. Uh, and then trimming envelope in position and then momentum. So there were four rounds of feedback for every cycle of error correction in their experiment. So we were inspired by that experiment and we would like to think how to do it in our ions, but there's a problem that's additional to the problems of just dealing with GKP states there. So one of the things we spotted was that if we were clever, we wouldn't have to do four cycles because Using that trick for the measurements that I told you about earlier of preceding it by a conditioning pulse, then we should be able to deal with the finite envelope in one go. And indeed, we've been able to do that. The other problem we have is something due to trapped ions, which is making measurements on the trapped ion. So our measurement of a trapped ion is all about the electronic state of the ion. And here are the lowest electronic states. And here are my qubit states that I use in the ion. Now, when I measure, what I like to do is I turn on lasers, which couple essentially this state to a fast decaying excited state. And at which point the ion emits photons and I can detect those photons and I see a bright dot if I, um, if I have the ion in this state. But if I'm in this state here, I don't couple to the lasers and I don't see uh, anything at all, right? Now, the problem is that we don't collect all the uh, photons that come from the ion. We collect about um, a little bit less than one in a hundred of them. Uh, and what this means is that actually we have to scatter 3000 photons in order to have high confidence that in the end we gain 30 photons or something if we're bright, none if we're dark, and, and that gives us high confidence that we are in one of these states. But that's a terrible thing from the point of view of the uh, oscillator, that's the motion of the ion, because every one of these photons gives recoil and kicks the ion in some random direction. And that completely destroys our GKP states. So our solution to this was uh, to modify this circuit somewhat. Instead of measuring and doing a classical relay to do feedback, we include the conditional feedback as an extra operation that we do before just resetting the spin. Yeah. So what it ends up doing is that we have to do three pulses with our two frequency laser uh, with the right parameters. And then now we can repump the ion and repumping the ion involves just scattering a couple of photons to get ourselves into the ground state again from the excited state. And this means there's very little recoil and that's an amount of error which we can actually correct uh, with our error correction code. So the photon recoil amplitude now becomes a little displacement for the GKP code. So now, uh, how does it look? Well, we need to do correction both in position and momentum. So for every round of error correction, we have to correct both of these uh, quadratures, if you like. Uh, and each of them now involves a very similar sequence. Uh, the only difference between these two is that there's a PQP in this one, i.e. it's working on primarily on position. And here it's QPQ, so it's primarily working on the momentum and trying to correct that. And each of those, you can think of some map that acts on the input density matrix. I just throw away the qubit here. There's a completely positive map that connects the input density matrix to the density matrix here. I call that row one and to the density matrix here. And now the only residual question is how I should choose these parameters. This parameter here is actually chosen by the stabilizer oper the operator I want to measure, which is the stabilizer displacement. And now I should think, how do I choose epsilon and uh, mu? Uh, and what we did was we looked at these operations and we said, if we have a state that has no error, how do we, can we choose these parameters to optimally preserve the original state? So that's how we did it in the experiment. So here, what you see is the, this is the correction value that you use for the displacement. And this is the fidelity of a single round of this correction. If I don't use my extra uh, correction for finite size pulse. Right? And so the highest I get up to is about 
If I now use this correction for finite size, which is the same one I used in the measurement, uh, you see a significantly improved fidelity of preservation of the state. And in fact, it's a factor of 30 improvements. So it's a pretty big improvement from the use of the correct finite, uh, correct operators for finite codes. So with that in mind, then with those settings, we were able to do quantum error correction uh, in an autonomous fashion on these uh, systems. So the first thing we did was actually to prepare uh, GKP states just by doing rounds of quantum error correction with these completely positive maps. So we start from an ion in the ground state, not in a GKP state at all. And we just apply uh, a set of uh, these two unitaries uh, and repump the qubit at the end, if you like. And what we see is convergence. This is measuring these stabilizer operators. We see convergence on the uh, eigenstates, which are the GKP states with a certain stabilizer value. Uh, and it converges within a few rounds. Uh -huh. Yeah. Epsilon and mu depend on the logical state that you're trying to stabilize in the previous slide? They don't depend on the logical state. No, that would be bad news, right? But they, um, I mean, they might change a little bit for different logical states. Uh, they do depend on how finite the state is that you're using. Yeah. So uh, if you used move to a different size of state, uh, and in our case, we're limited by various factors at the moment, and we're changing the experiment to get around that, uh, then you would need different values of epsilon and mu. That's the main thing. So it, it depends on the size of envelope you're trying to achieve, essentially. That's the deal. Good. Any other questions at that point? No, then let me continue. So uh, here again, uh, here I looked at the onset of the state. So here I start from the ground state. I end up in a GKP state, or at least an approximation, with a stabilizer value of 80% or so. Now what we do is we just look, if we prepare this state and keep on applying the stabilization, how do the measurements of the stabilizers change as a function of number of cycles? And you see that the stabilizers reach a steady state. We reach a steady state state type of state uh, as a function of uh, number of cycles. And for instance, here we're going over 15 milliseconds or so uh, of our ion in the trap. Uh, if we turn the stabilization off, then you can see there's a pretty rapid decay of this GKP state. So the, the stabilizers there, if we just wait some amount of time and then measure, uh, they decay within a millisecond or so uh, from being the original states to something uh, very different, right? So at some level, the stabilization certainly works on reaching a steady state of some uh, state with a pretty decent projection on the, on the stabilizer. But the interesting thing would be how do, well do we preserve logical coherence? Uh, and so this is what's seen here. These are measurements now of logical operators as a function of the number of cycles of error correction. So we go out to 200 or so cycles of error correction. Uh, here in the Crosses, what you see is for the different logical operators, X, Y, and Z, I wish I'd labeled them now. Uh, you see that the decay is uh, fairly uh, rapid, right? Uh, so what we do here, we, provide, we, pres we prepare a given logical state, uh, and then we apply the error correction and we see how the logical observable decays, right? And so we see that uh, coherence times on the level of two milliseconds or so for these logical states. And now if we perform the error correction, we see that we can extend that coherence by a factor of three or so out to 12 milliseconds, or in fact, for the worst axis, this is nine or so milliseconds. Yeah? So we've got a factor of 3.4 increase in logical coherence over an uncorrected uh, qubit. Now you might ask, why is it so much worse on one axis? Uh, and one of the things to think about is that the uh, X and Z stabilizers are vectors that point to here and point to here, yeah? And the Y uh, is a longer vector. And that's a problem for us because um, one of our main problems is that uh, this whole phase space rotates about the origin. And that means that the further out you are, the points become more blurred more quickly. The other thing that's a challenge is that we use these finite states. And this Y observable corresponds to being further out in the, um, in the finite state. And so you're more uh, at danger of uh, corruption due to the errors of finite size states. Yeah? So this is a reason why the, for us, the Y is never as good. So the green is actually Y is never as good as the X or Z uh, stabilization. So we also performed uh, 
similar things with what's called a hexagonal GKP code. I won't say too much about that, just to say that the grid there is based on a set of um, triangles or a hexagonal sort of structure in phase space. We also get extensions in logical coherence there, but not, not as good and not as good on all axes. Uh, we think that's partly because the logical observables are just naturally further out in phase space on all axes in this hexagonal state. Uh, y is the Y observable less good than X and Z here. It looks very symmetric. Uh, in our case, because we only do stabilization of X and Z and we didn't do it on the Y axis. So there may be that this asymmetry would be got rid of, I would imagine so, if we also stabilized along the Y axis. But in general, this code is not quite as good, I think, because it needs more extent out into the phase space. And this makes us susceptible to dephasing and to the finite size. Okay, so that's where the experimental data has taken us. Now we're starting to think about uh, extending that and how to do two qubit gates on error corrected qubits. So this is now mainly theory work. So what do we need? We need a, a, a sort of gate, which uh, looks like this. This is a, a phase gate which is an exponential of the position of one uh, of the oscillators and the position of a second oscillator, which is encoding a second qubit. This is the type of gate we'd like to realize. In trapped ions, that's not quite what we have. If we have two ions in a trap, then we can think about the Coulomb interaction between the two. And in the right regime where they're fairly distanced, then what we have is a, basically a beam splitter interaction, which conserves uh, energy. And if you write that out, then you see that it, it does contain a term that's similar to what we want, but it also contains another term, which is exactly not what we want, is in, in the momentum uh, basis. So that can be fixed by uh, squeezing. Uh, and squeezing, what can it do? It can enhance uh, position, for instance, at the expense of momentum. And so uh, that's something that uh, NIST have recently produced very nice results on. They modulate their trap frequency of their iron uh, at twice the motional frequency of the iron, and this squeezes the motional state. So they were performing interferometry measurements uh, with this sort of uh, setup. So if you combine then squeezing with this type of beam splitter interaction and then anti-squeeze again, what you see is you get a very similar thing to the beam splitter, except that you get an enhancement of this Q1, Q2 uh, term versus the P1, P2 term, which gets suppressed. Yeah? So we can realize exactly the CZ gate if we uh, set the amount of time for the beam splitter interaction and the amount of squeezing to the right uh, parameters, uh, then we can get a good approximation to this uh, gate. Now that's one type of approximation, right? This is the approximation of how well do I make this operation uh, compared to the original uh, CZ gate? And we think that can be rather good. Uh, here, we're looking at some sort of fidelity. I won't tell you what, what it is. Uh, here's actually the ideal operation, that's the orange curve. Uh, and here's the case when we have um, the approximate operation and we see for squeezing parameters above about 0.8 or for one or so, the approximation is fairly good. And a lot of this stuff that then leads to deterioration is actually numerical challenges in, in doing the simulations. Yeah, so these were done by a master's uh, student, Paul Moser. So, um, but you'll see that this fidelity is not one, it's 0.63. Uh, and the reason for that is the same old problem we've had before. We're using finite states. These are all simulations, but nevertheless, there are finite input states in here. And in doing the gate, then we have broadening of the envelope and, and also broadening of the peaks. And just to show you that, the, the red curve here is before the gate operation. And it's just looking at the marginals of one of these logical qubits, one of the particular oscillators. And you'll see these narrow peaks and you see that the envelope is given by this blue curve. After the gate, looking in the momentum distribution, you see that the, you get these green curves. So the individual um, Gaussians have been broadened, the peaks have been broadened, and you see that this envelope has been broadened uh, too. And that gives you the impression that this problem is, is both envelope and peak broadening. And what I told you about in the error correction is that that can solve both of these. We, that's something we simultaneously solve is to narrow both of these envelopes, uh, and that's ha what happens in the error correction. And we've seen that it's very nice. In fact, that's exactly what can happen. Uh, if you then follow the, the gate itself by rounds of error correction cycles, you can push the uh, uh, real finite state after the gate 
onto the value that you'd expect for the output state, the logical output state, uh, accounting for the fact that in this case, the, there are also finite states. So we think that we, uh, by combining this approximate gate, which we think can be a decent approximation, and following it by error correction, we think we can take out the errors that seem to occur in the gate. And somehow this feels to me like errors that fall into a gauge degree of freedom. If, if any of you know these sort of degenerate codes uh, uh, in qubit codes, uh, this feels like the same thing that the error correction itself can somehow pull you back out of a, an irrelevant uh, change in the state that you don't have to worry too much about. So with that in mind, then uh, let me conclude. I've told you about uh, experimental work we've done where we've realized error correction on a, a GKP logical qubit using dissipation. Uh, we're at the moment thinking about how to get to break even. That's a bunch of noise and also some better approximations to the actual operations that I showed you, uh, which I can discuss in more detail if anyone wants to know. Uh, in simultaneously, we're thinking about how to implement two qubit uh, error corrected gates, just as I've told you just now. We've been doing theory on that. And we're also building an experiment now dedicated to GKP states. And, and you see the trap for that experiment, which we're trying to load uh, at the moment, which is uh, really dedicated to working with these states, whereas the original results were in an apparatus which fell on this by accident. So with that, then I'd like to thank you for your attention and your questions so far. I hope I didn't overrun too much and I look forward to any further questions that you have. I should of course, thank the people who did the work. Uh, it's not all of these people. Uh, primarily the experimental work I would say was uh, Brennan and Thanlon Miken. Uh, Martin and Tanya were also playing contributions. And uh, in theory, we have uh, these guys led by Florentine Reiter, uh, but uh, Paul and Ivan are really actively involved. So that's great to follow. Thanks for your attention and yes.